So, in the last video, I told you there's a housing shortage. I'll assume you're at least a little curious as to why that is. First of all, let's introduce ourselves to the most important statistic in this entire conversation, vacancy rates. There's a lot of data that suggests a strong correlation between vacancy rates and the overall rent, i.e. when there are more units to choose from, landlords have to compete and stop increasing rents. As you can see, this data is specific to Canada and gathered by the government. I don't have the resources to provide statistics for every corner of the world, but if you're interested in some more evidence to support these claims, I've got links to the description too. This video by BritMonkey, demonstrating the sheer scale of this issue and the benefits of addressing it. This article by Todd Littman, a hub of high quality sources. And my government's housing supply report commissioned by an expert panel. Which brings us to the ownership market. Regardless of how you attain access to the homes, there's another reason why more is better. Filtering. When there's a severe shortage, people tend to stay in relatively affordable units, even if they could afford something slightly more expensive simply because of the lack of choices. Say you're a parent in a typical nuclear family with two kids. You both work full-time jobs and could afford an $800,000 home. You want to move out your two-bedroom apartment into a townhouse, but you can't find any in the neighborhood you love. It's all million-dollar detached houses. and you don't want to move further away into the suburbs. So even though new housing is often for the upper middle class, this frees up more affordable units, which has an immediate impact all the way down the chain. In Victoria, a horribly out of date census data shows that as of 2016, we were short between 4,500 and 6,500 homes to let adults move out from their parents' places, provide enough bedrooms, provide homes for workers, house the homeless population, and all while increasing the vacancy rate. Furthermore, Victoria's housing future, the report this is from, argued that even adding 7,000 units immediately wouldn't remove all the pressures we're feeling. So generally, the number of units cities must build is a constantly moving target, meaning we shouldn't center policies around this vague gap. What we do understand are some of the policies that led to this shortage. Here, British Columbia in particular, we haven't matched the past concerted government-backed efforts to build housing, and North American zoning guarantees it will be a painful process. With a few exceptions, the main one being tearing down a single-family home and building another one, every single development has to go through a grueling approval process. In this specific part of Victoria, it looks like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, ah! That's five stages where you can be turned down and every jurisdiction seems to have their own way of doing things. This process makes trying to build anything good, slow, risky, and ultimately more expensive. That means little profits, which means no loan from the bank. So if it's easier to stick with destroying farmlands and forests for sprawl, then that's what's going to happen. Developers run a business like any other, and compared to oil companies or big tech, it's impossible to say developers are the ones screwing people over. Yes, there are corrupt developers out there, and you know why? because sometimes it's impossible to get anything built otherwise. When we change our zoning, the market becomes diverse and interesting, with more small businesses rising to the challenge, delivering creativity and innovation. So, the year is 2032. We've built a bunch of housing. People moved out of their parents, roommates, or ex's place. Families stayed in the cities instead of moving away. Young workers are still here. We aren't the retirement capital. We closed the construction gap. Vacancy rates are at a healthy 5%, and prices remain stable. Okay, cool, I guess, but how do we get there? By changing the f zoning to allow more efficient land use in more places. What does that look like? We'll find out in the next episode.